back when I first got my Atari ST for Christmas in the 90s, I received the ST itself, its box, some software and the Atari power pack. My ST was second hand, purchased from my good friend Michael for a Christmas present, but the impact of that power pack felt the same as if it were a brand new machine and I'd just been presented with the key to enough entertainment to last a lifetime or a good number of weeks at the very least. The Power Pack was a compilation of 20 superb software games included with the Atari STFM models sold from 1989 onwards. Its inclusion with new machines was genius and boosted the ST's sales as a gaming system significantly. But this wasn't the first game bundle to be included with the ST range. The STFM had been launched in 1986 to provide a more friendly home computer compared to the earlier ST models, which lacked a TV modulator and internal floppy drive. Over in North America, the machine was marketed with less emphasis on gaming. Whilst Atari over in Europe had cottoned onto the machine's main selling point, and by 1988 bundles such as the Summer Pack and Super Pack appeared. The Super Pack also contained 20 games, but didn't perform as well as the Power Pack. The main reasons for this were that games were generally better in the Power Pack, with it filled with more recognisable arcade hits. And also importantly that the bundle price dropped from £399 to £299 during its release. Europe was already a region gripped by the Home Micro, having been weaned on Sinclair's Spectrums, Amstrad CPCs and Commodore's 64s. So with consoles like the Sega Mega Drive only and Eastern Whisper, the ST seemed an obvious choice. Of course, there was also a Amiga rivalry, but on screenshots, ST games looked pretty identical to Amiga games, and given the Amiga was more expensive and lacking a huge game bundle, the choice for children, if not their parents, often fell to the ST. The Power Pack therefore seemed to be Atari's masterstroke, but it was also part of its downfall. You see, 20 games is a lot of games. For me, it kept me entertained for as long as I needed, and this often meant that sales of third-party titles was less than perhaps on rival systems, such as the Amiga. It wasn't long before publishers got frustrated with this, and rather than developing ST games to port to the Amiga, flipped it around. This posed a problem, as converting a game designed to take advantage of the custom Amiga hardware to the ST was harder than the other way around. This meant the Amiga began to amass a collection of exclusive titles, and what's more, even converted titles began to look a lot better on the Amiga, and Commodore's machine began to widen the market share until the ST faded away. Of course, this isn't all of the story, and with the rise of the IBM compatible PC and game consoles, both platforms were commercially doomed anyway. But it played its part, just like I'm about to do with each of the Power Pack games. So without further ado, let us begin with Disc A Afterburner. Before we dive into the gameplay, it's worth noting that in their original commercial incarnations, some of these games were spread across more than one double density floppy. Afterburner is one of those titles, but the reduction is not all down to compression, or the switch from single sided to double sided discs. Some elements are missing from these games, in this case the arcade theme tune is missing from the loading screen. Of course, this isn't an essential ingredient, but to frequenters of arcades, it made these home conversions feel just that little bit closer to an authentic experience. And it's more important than you might think. It puts you in that arcade mindset, standing in front of a cabinet, because although the game itself isn't terrible, the ST hardware just wasn't up to replicating the rapid, engaging gameplay. It does though get my vote for being the only game in this pack where you don't actually need to do anything to progress. Disc B, R-Type. 
what can I say about this game, other than my version requiring you to press a key at a specific time during loading, otherwise it didn't load, something Michael and I worked out probably through accident, it's a timeless game. The arcade version was superb, and the ST version holds up remarkably well even on the sound front, but it's a double edged sword because also, like the arcade version, it's a hard game, with limited checkpoints throughout each level. Disc C, Gauntlet 2, probably my favourite game in the pack. This kept us engaged for hours and hours, roaming dungeons trying not to shoot the food. It's just an incredibly playable and addictive game, and the ST conversion is spot on. The ST doesn't have hardware scrolling, but scrolling is nevertheless perfect here. In fact, the game is so close to the arcade, even down to the speech samples, that I couldn't choose between them. Disc D, Super Hang On. By this point, it's already pretty easy to see why this pack was such a winner. The Electric Dreams take on Sega's arcade sensation is graphically pleasing, fast and even sports some impressive road undulation. Even the four arcade tunes are chucked in. You can play using either mouse or joystick with the latter somewhat preferable. Overall, it's a pretty good conversion. Disc E, Space Harrier, another Sega classic and another impressive arcade conversion, moving at a good pace and offering some frantic gameplay. I didn't play this much in my younger years, but the colours and speed always captivated me, along with that woolly mammoth thing on the loading screen. Disc F, the first disc to feature a multitude of titles, three in fact, starting with Star Glider. I'll admit, I used to load this game up just to hear that intro music. I rarely played the actual game, which is a shame because by all accounts, it's pretty good. Developed by Argonaut Software, Jez Sands worked on the C64 Elite release before creating this, and it shows. The 3D graphics are great for the ST, especially an 80s release, and once you get into it, the gameplay is very good. A bit like an Elite Lite. The next title on this disc is Overlander, a game which exudes a dystopian feel from the outset. That shadowy car, the initial choices to make, followed by the bleak in-game graphics. I was a fan of these qualities alone, really it's a somewhat primitive clone of Atari's Road Blaster. A drab clone, and I like it for that. Which brings us on to Super Huey. For some reason I barely loaded this one up back in the day. It's a helicopter game, yeah. It's alright. Disc G, Eliminator. This is almost like a cross between Overlander and Space Harrier, and it's another game which exudes the arcade feel, although this Houston release isn't actually an arcade game. The music and sound effects aren't quite up to scratch, but the gameplay will draw you in and keep you hooked. Thanks to a password system, progression isn't too much of a chore either. Also on disc G, Nebulous, another Houston Consultants game and one which I'm sure you're well aware of. Playing as the creature Pogo, your mission is to destroy eight towers built in the sea. You do this by navigating around each tower and planting a bomb at the top. Pretty simple, but the beauty lies in the convincing clockwise and anti-clockwise turning of the tower, creating a sense of depth and marking the game out as something pretty unique, especially in its day. The final title on disc G, Pac-Mania, is not quite up to the same standards as the Amiga release, but it has smooth scrolling in its half-screen display area, and it plays well. I mean, it's Pac-Man from an isometric perspective. It's not for everyone, but I loved the 3D effect back then, and I still do today. Disc H, Predator, Arnie, getting to the chopper. Marvellous stuff. Being a fan of the film, even at the age of 9, this was one game I loved getting stuck into. Like a lot of these games, it's pretty darn hard, but it does capture the story of the film in a certain side-scrolling fashion. Saying that, the scrolling isn't perfect, but it's not the shabbiest either. 
Targeting at angles can be a bit of a pain as can running away from the Predator's sights when it appears, but overall it's a reasonable port of the 8-bit versions. Interestingly, due to licensing, a few rare packs contain Winter Olympiad 88 instead. Disc Eye, another three games, starting with Bomboozle, a puzzle game where the aim is to destroy all the bombs. To do this, you step on a bomb to light it. You may then take one step and then the bomb will explode. It's a simple formula which works well, offering another isometric game of delight. Although you can switch to a top-down view as well, which is nice. I also like these early games for the blatant use of the developer's voice in speech samples. More bombs with the classic Bomb Jack next. I loved this game on the Spectrum, I played it a lot, so by the time I got my hands on the ST, its appeal had waned a little, but it's still a decent version of the 1984 arcade classic. Playing as Bomb Jack, your job is to collect the bombs. Pretty simple. And yes, that tune does get very annoying. To round up this disc, we have Xenon by the incredibly talented Bitmap Brothers. Driving and flying your craft through four stages of alien territory, your job is really to destroy as much as possible. Good graphics, good scrolling and good gameplay ensure the longevity of one of the first games to truly take the ST hardware for a run. Disc J, Double Dragon. What can I say about this game? After Gauntlet 2, this is probably the game I've sunk the most hours into. Sure, it's not arcade perfect, but then the arcade game was never perfect anyway, and at least it includes the arcade music. Both versions slow down when there are too many sprites on screen, but I'm okay with that, especially because you get to turn on your brother and beat the crap out of him at the end. It's one of the easiest games here, but also one of the most enjoyable. Remember, this was pre-Streets of Rage days. Disc K contains Black Lamp. What was this game about? I honestly couldn't tell you from memory alone, and my playtime of it is somewhat limited. It turns out to be a medieval melodrama featuring Jolly Jack the Jovial Jester on a quest to rid evil from the kingdom. To do this, you must collect 20 lamps, with the most powerful black lamp guarded by a dragon. Of course. The story makes little sense, but apparently magazines liked it back in the day. On the same disc we have Outrun. It's clear that reviewers were more lenient back in the 80s. Saying that, I played this a fair deal, and I remember enjoying it. I think it's because I'd come from the Spectrum version, and so this was a step up. I mean, at the very least, it had reasonable music and colourful graphics. Playing it today, however, isn't a nostalgic gathering of bliss. It's a frame-churning little wretch of a game, which only just manages to keep you playing till the end. Disc L, the final disc of games containing Star Ray and Star Goose. Star Ray is another title I barely remember playing. I'm not sure why it didn't grab me, but it's probably because I was too busy playing R-Type. It's a conversion by Steve Back, responsible for gems such as Gold Runner, and his skill shines through, featuring an amazing seven layers of parallax scrolling. That's two more than the Amiga version. Take that, you Commodore people. Star Goose involves you as a hover ship, eight looped levels of heavily defended surfaces and various crystals, of which you must collect. Like other games here, you can control by either joystick or mouse, but also like other games, joystick is preferable. Dying will send you back to the start of your current level, so you can enjoy the game at a moderate pace. It's a nice one for diving into occasionally, when you feel like some concentrated but relaxed action. And that's it, that's the Power Pack. Arguably, the Atari language disc, organizer, and music maker are also part of this pack, but I'm sticking to the games in this episode. We can cover those another time, maybe. 
But given the quality and variety of games on offer here, it's easy to see how this helped shift so many STs as the 80s drew to a close. I mean, many of these titles were on sale at the same time for £20 or £30 each. It's also easy to see how this kept many gamers, like myself, more than contented, pushing the ST game market to dry up just that little bit quicker. But it's a double-edged sword. Without this pack, not as many STs would have been sold, and the problem would remain. Really, the end of the ST as a gaming platform was inevitable. But at least I had great fun with it, along with many others, whilst it lasted.